Just takes a couple of clicks to get it onto Facebook Live, and we are all set. Awesome. So everyone, thank you so much for joining Devil 2020 Workshop Wednesdays. We have TL Luke with us here today talking about Commissions 101. Without further ado, TL, I'll let you take it over. All right. Um, and also without further ado, uh, my, okay, so commissions are my total backbone to my business. So I have a huge presentation. And so I'm going to just dive right in and open up um, the shared screen right away. So just so you know, we will be doing that. All right, now. Okay. Um, I would also recommend if you have, um, sometimes videos automatically pop up of participants on the right-hand side of your screen, I'd recommend uh, minimizing those and like throwing them towards the bottom if they are up uh, because I will be using the full screen. Um, so, okay. <laughs> so, hey everybody. Um, before I be would be or before I begin, I would like to thank Dabble for having me and all of you for joining us tonight for this little special workshop. Uh, as Sarah said, I'm TL Luke. Um, I'm a full-time illustrator and muralist here in Madison. And during this pandemic, um, I make about 80% of my income from commissions. I've only been in business since October 2018, but in that time I've completed over 100 commissions, um, averaging around 60 per year. Um, so. I had to learn a lot on the job, <laughs> as I'm sure a lot of you have as well. Um, so this Commissions 101 workshop is really an amalgamation of all of the things that I had to learn over the years. Um, so this has a lot of info, <laughs> so I'm going to request that you guys, again, as Sarah said, compile your questions for the very end. Uh, feel free to add them to the chat bar. Um, uh, and so that we have a compiled list of questions. And this is all just to ensure that I finish in the hour timeline, because like I said, this is a very long <laughs> uh, kind of slideshow. Uh, so I'm gonna just go ahead and begin. Um, so the first thing, ooh, oh, 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 okay, hold on, not the first thing. Can I do? Okay, perfect. Okay. <laughs> uh, so the first thing uh, that we're going to talk about is what even are commissions. Um, this might be super obvious for most of you, especially if you're a working artist or writer or musician. Um, but this is Commissions 101. So there may be a few of you who have are new to this idea of commissions. So for those folks, welcome. Uh, so commissions are custom work for a paying third party. This is important. If it's custom work for a non-paying third party, like a friend who wants a free painting of their dog <laughs> because you just graduated with your expensive BFA, that would be considered a gift. Uh, that is not a commission. Um, my goal with today's workshop is, or okay, before I go into that, is so like some examples of, um, types of commissions is if you're a painter, you're going to be making a painting for a client. If you're a musician, maybe you're doing some custom jingles for like the opening of a podcast. Um, or if you're a writer, you're writing articles for a local magazine. Those are all considered commissions. You are putting work out there that you are actively getting money for. So, uh, like I was saying, the goal for today's workshop is to give you guys these building blocks for taking commissions head on. Uh, so y'all stop giving your amazing artwork away for free or nearly for free. And let me just apologize right away. I may say artwork a lot or things that reference just visual arts as I am a, a visual artist myself. Um, so this, this workshop should also be somewhat relevant to uh, disciplines outside of visual arts, but just to let you know, that, that may be the language that kind of pops up naturally <laughs> as we go through this. Um, anyway, so the things I'm gonna cover are, uh, 
So structuring commissions into the business like that you already have or are like expecting to build for yourself. Um, how to value yourself appropriately, both with pricing and with confidence in your own self-worth, because they do go at hand in hand. Um, methods on how to gain clients, both now and after COVID. And, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the ins and outs of contracts, security deposits, and payment plans. And then lastly, how to maintain and cultivate client relationships. So let's begin with the business structure. Um, and yes, that's a, a little picture of me <laughs> delighted about my business. Um, uh, okay, so one of the most common questions that I get from aspiring artists or you know anybody in this field is, am I ready to start doing commissions? And if you're asking that question, the chances are, yeah, dude, you are definitely ready to start having this conversation and start moving forward. And then usually the next question is, but how? So let me tell you. Uh, so when I was first starting my business, I knew I was ready to take on commissions because I wanted to have a profitable business. Um, you may be at that same point. If that's the case, it's time to think about how commissions fit into your overall business structure. Uh, so for example, <laughs> uh, let's say you are a fiber artist and you wanna do custom commissioned uh, stuffed animals of little kids monster drawings. Let's just say that's what it is. Uh, you want 25% of your uh, overall business profit to be from market sales of some more standard stuffed animals that you make, 25% teaching parents how to sew, you know, with their kids or something like that. So 25% in teaching and then 50% of the business you want to be commission income. And this is just, this could be anything, <laughs> you know, you might have totally different percentages of how you're kind of imagining what could happen. This is all before you start taking commissions. Um, so because you wanted half of your business to be commission based, that means half of your time should be spent on commissions. So if you're working 40 hours a week, 20 of those hours should be commission, uh, t time for commissions and Let's just throw out there, like, let's say you want to make $300 a week on commissions. Uh, so in those 20 hours, you know that you can make about three commissions. Um, so presto, magico, <laughs> we know that $100 per commission is your minimum. So that is $300 a week for 20 hours, three average commissions, 100 per commission. So that's just, that's, you know, that's a lot of numbers and a lot of kind of mumbo jumbo, um, but that's just an example. So if, uh, like if you average 30 stuffed animals in 20 hours, let's say, that doesn't mean you should charge a minimum of $10 per stuffed animal. Um, this is just more a way to find that bare minimum um, and then we'll talk about kind of the value portion of pricing in the next section. So, a, <laughs> the last thing that I want to do in business structure is kind of throw a quick hot tip at you. So, take some real time for yourself and write out some short and long-term goals. This helps organize business strategies and timelines for reaching those goals. Um, and these goals don't have to be commission related. They can be all sorts of business related things like salaries, like ideal salaries or skill learning or big project dream jobs that you'd like to have. Um, some of those goals, like the ones that I have listed here are like some literal goals that I had written out um, for my own business could literally be, I want to take on less commissions, <laughs> you know, so starting understanding that you can adjust these goals at any time, but also just helps 
again, get that timeline going. Um, okay. Okay. So we're going to jump right into um, value and pricing, which this is such a topic, right? So this is the most stressful part about being a creative, a creative business owner um, is putting a price tag on your art and your work. So it's the most debated topic in the art world. Uh, recently, I was invited to chat with WORT here in Madison with alongside a couple of other local artists. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, we discussed how businesses tend to undervalue artists. It's a detrimental mindset we've had as a society since we were born, you know, this idea of the quote unquote starving artists or gifts of exposure or uh, getting less pay because we're quote, doing what we love, <laughs> you know. I'm sure we've all heard this. If you are a practicing artist, if you are a working artist, uh, that, is such, <laughs> that, is, that is such the bane of our existence, right? Um, so that's why I want to begin this section with this very clear fact. You are a professional providing a service, full stop. Um, memorize it. If you don't advocate for yourself and your skills and your very self-worth, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, you will be taken advantage of. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable doing that in the long term, uh, maybe consider getting an agent for yourself. Um, that being said, I won't be talking about agents tonight uh, because I don't have one and I'm not actually totally sure how that process works. Um, so uh, uh, apologies for that. Um, but yes, just keep remembering this. You are a professional providing a service. You're not just a fun artist type that gives away free art, you know, this is, this is a job. So let's just jump right in. Uh, there are two types of pricing uh, that is most prominent in really any field that involves um, giving services, which is flat rate versus hourly. Uh, so the flat rate is the a flat total that you give the client after um, kind of like hammering out their commission, you have a good idea of what they're expecting, um, you have a good idea of what materials are gonna be used. You compile all of that with your estimated time um, based on an hourly wage that you give yourself, and we'll kind of talk about that. Um, and this is kind of an immovable rate. So you would send out a contract or send out an invoice or just informally tell them, you know, based on these things, your commission will be $200. On the other hand, there's hourly, uh, which is the actual time spent on a, uh, on a commission plus materials on a different line item of an invoice. Um, and it's basically your value of your experience um, put again into a wage that you, an hourly wage that you give yourself, um, this is changeable. So you could gently quote a client like this will take four hours and if it like it might take five hours and so then you would charge for the full actual amount of time so you would charge for that five hours again we were going to go into these individually in just a second so when you're first starting out these um these kind of hourly wages or like estimated times and stuff they're going to be total guesstimations because you might not have done commissions before. This might be your first commission. Uh, so let's look at what this might look like in practice. So uh, have you already, so a few questions that you should ask yourself is, have you already done a commission um, or a few commissions even? 
And if not, I recommend maybe doing some mock commissions. Um, and I would pull out a spreadsheet and record these down. So start a spreadsheet that records the total hours it took you to work on this commission or this mock commission, the total you charged if you already did the commission <clears throat> and charged the client versus like if it's a mock commission, it could be like, well, if I wanna do this portrait, this is something that I would maybe charge $100 for. Um, let's like, let me get started and time myself to see how long uh, it takes me to finish this. And then re uh, record the hourly pay for the commissions you've done. Um, so that would be the net total divided by the total number of hours will give you that hourly pay. Um, this is what I did when I first started out. My first, I'm still recording all of my commissions and doing it in this way. But when I first started out, it was more a way to help me figure out some pricing norms. Um, so for example, my first three commissions when I first started out, I only charged $100 each. And then after the fact, realized that I was only paying myself a minimum wage because these commissions were very complex and ended up taking me 11 to 13 hours to finish each one. So I learned from that. I saw the numbers, was like, oh my God, I do not want to get paid $7.69 an hour at any point of my life. <laughs> like, so by the end of 2019, I ended up getting a lot faster at what my like at these commissions these ones that i had first started out on i can now do in half the amount of time and i charge a lot more so my hourly pay as you can see on this example is now more like 75 dollars an hour um rather than seven dollars an hour uh so um to kind of decide whether to do flat rate or versus hourly when you're first starting out, I would recommend starting with flat rate. Um, and here's why. <laughs> so timing new projects is really hard, especially when you don't know what your own trend is. And that's why it's really important to record everything your first year, especially so that you can learn from your, your own trends from that year. Um, for example, again, in 2019, my work was purely digital illustration, so no material cost. And so I could charge a lot lower for commissions. Um, but as you can see in this image, uh, my hours are all over the place. <laughs> it goes between two hours to 20 hours, depending on the project. But I knew it was going to look like that. I knew I was going to be all over the place. I was just starting out. I had no idea. So I charged a flat rate until I could get my hours to something more consistent. Starting out with a flat rate when you're first starting with commissions allows for that flexibility. And then clients won't be penalized for your inexperience. So you like aren't going to tell them, this will only take me four hours. And then they're expecting like, okay, this will be around, you know, whatever four hours looks like for you, let's say $100 um, for $25 an hour charge more than that. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, and then it takes you 10 hours to do. And that's so like, <laughs> that's over half or over twice as expensive as what you quoted them. It could keep them from becoming a repeat client. Like, it's a little messier when you're first starting out. So until you kind of get into a consistent groove, things start like, like right now, I know that I can do sketches in like 30 minutes to an hour. Um, you know, like, so you, you figure out this little time gap and whatever. And so then later, if you wanted to, you can change to hourly. You don't have to stick at flat rate, but I do recommend staying there for your first year. Um, while you're doing, while you're like kind of recognizing kind of your own trends after you've kind of been like, looking over how like which projects took longer that kind of thing you might start seeing some different categories that you can start breaking your flat rates into um so for example with my 
with my own uh, like price breakdown, my flat rate price breakdowns that are on my website. Uh, I have animal portraits versus people portraits. I have a simple portrait with a simple background versus a complex portrait with a complex background. And they just keep getting more expensive as you go into these different breakdowns. Um, so for example, uh, for a flat rate, you might be thinking to yourself like, okay, I'm gonna charge in my head like $50 an hour. And I predict that this commission will take three hours to do. So that's 150. And then the materials for it are about $70. I'm gonna throw that all at the client. So the flat rate total that you would tell the client at the beginning or like after you've, you know, again, figured out kind of what this will look like, the flat rate total would then be $220. Um, I would also recommend as just a little aside, uh, keep raising your prices each year. That's totally normal. Uh, I started at measly $25 an hour and then went up to $50 an hour last year. And this year I'm at $75 an hour. You can keep going up. Um, and clients will understand that. That is a normal thing, again, for a professional to do each year. So the pros and cons of flat rate. Pro, you can set a flat price uh, that would usually average out to about $50 an hour, but then it takes you way less time to finish it. So you're actually getting like $100 per hour. Um, and this, in, in my experience, is more often the case, uh, where the con for flat rate is sometimes a piece takes you so much longer than you were imagining it to be, and you're not gonna get paid for that extra time. So hourly. <laughs> so I recommend hourly if you feel pretty freaking confident in your consistency. Like I said, you won't quote the client four hours and then charge them for 10. Um, I would recommend it if every project is notably different and hard to list a simple flat rate, like how I broke it up into four different categories of flat rates. Um, in this case, like for example, for graphic designers, they tend to be hourly because you know each business has a different project, has a different need, might be labels, might be box, whatever. Like hourly just works better then. Um, and I would recommend hourly if you want to make sure you get paid for those extra hours, especially if you predict the client will change their mind a lot. Um, you can usually tell uh, when a client is a little uh, is a little unsure of what they want and then they kind of change their mind in every email correspondence or something like that, that's maybe when I would consider <laughs> uh, going to hourly or, and I'll cover this in a minute, perhaps doing both. Um, but while we're still on hourly, uh, Clocky Slim is a really great recording app that I use to record my own hours. But again, I am a digital illustrator, so I work from my computer. So that is convenient for me. Um, before I was a digital illustrator, I was an, a traditional oil painter. Um, so uh, with that experience, I this is what I'll say for studio work is, I would, if you're doing hourly as a studio work person, um, I would record the time you get into the studio. So include the time it takes you to set up everything because that's time, that's your time. Um, I would record your breaks, like don't charge the client for lunch. Um, and then when you leave the studio, including the time it takes to clean up because time is money. <laughs> so uh, I would not just charge, um, just for the time that, if you're a painter, for example, don't charge them just for the time that you're finally sitting down in front of the easel, you know, unless you're like really dinking around <laughs> in your studio, maybe, you know, like lower the hour or whatever on that a little bit, but um, you, you deserve to be paid for all of that time. Anyways, if you are a digital illustrator and you use Procreate, uh, which is a program on the iPad Pro, it automatically records your time. So this is how I got such accurate hours my first year since all of my projects were done on my iPad Pro. So uh, an example of, of an hourly breakdown for an invoice 
uh, say again, the materials are $70, throw that on there. And then if you um, say your average hourly is you know $40 an hour, you estimate the project will take 10 hours, throw that on there, um, break it up into two separate line items, materials versus hourly, um, and then the hourly total would be $470. Uh, pros and cons of hourly. Uh, pro, a piece may take more time than expected, so you'll be able to get paid for said time. Uh, ideally, this only happens because a client changes their mind more than twice and you can charge them for that time. Um, so again, it's, it's pretty much the hourly pro is the flat rate con. Likewise, the hourly con is the flat rate pro. Uh, a piece may take a lot less time than you were expecting, so you're getting paid less. And I threw in a personal example. So for digital illustrations, I charge a flat rate of 350 if it's a complex illustration. If I charged $50 an hour and ended up finishing one of those complex uh, illustrations in just three hours, which definitely has happened, <laughs> I would only get paid $150. So that is a $200 difference, um, which I don't know, I want to, I want to get paid for that, right? So, uh, <laughs> so why not both? So after your first year, uh, you can, I mean, you can do this at any time, you could do this in six months or whatever, too. Um, after my first year, I implemented both flat rate and hourly. Uh, it is the best of both worlds because I can charge a flat rate for um, for a project and I put down in writing that that includes two changes during the sketch and one change to the final inked product. Any changes after that, I charge $50 an hour. So that kind of eliminates the extra time problem when in in writing where if you have a client who, again, kind of seems like they might change their mind a lot, putting it in there saying like, you know, I will charge you for extra time and extra changes, it both helps you and the client in the end because that will signal to the client that you will be charging them extra if they make a bunch of changes and will thus then maybe take their time, <laughs> more time to consider what they really want in this project before kind of jumping in and being like, this is what I want. And then seeing a schedule and being like, just kidding, change everything. I want this different thing. Just kidding, change everything. You know, like it eliminates that excitable, unsure what they want kind of client. And it kind of makes them go like, okay, <laughs> I don't want to get charged $50 an hour for each change that is made. So I better figure out what I want right away. And then that makes your life easier because you're not having to do a million freaking changes <laughs> to a project needlessly. Uh, so that's my, that's my hot take on <laughs> flat rate versus hourly. Uh, what I will say is do not undervalue your work because you're afraid no one will hire you. I want to underline that a million times. This just allows a precedent for clients to keep underpaying artists across the board. Trust me, $30 is too cheap for a painting. I say this because, like I said, if you, if you put it out there, like, uh, okay, I'll only do this thing that is probably in, in actuality worth $500, I'll do it for $30. Like, it, for other painters in town or other illustrators, all of a sudden now they have to lower their own prices to meet this new really unfair wage demand. Um, and it's true across the board. So don't undervalue your work. If you price it like you should, as you deserve, um, as a professional, <laughs> uh, then everybody else can kind of raise like ride, uh, raise their prices to that new standard and then businesses and clients like individual clients will have this understanding that like okay every artist i've talked to is in this range this is normal so 30 dollars is too cheap for a painting 
that's it. Okay. So here's some real quick hot tips for flat rate versus hourly as we close up this section. Um, if you are an illustrator or a graphic artist, buy the Graphic Artist Guild Handbook of Pricing and Ethical Guidelines. It is currently on Amazon for just $22.99. Um, but you can, I also recommend getting it from a local bookshop. Um, the reason I uh, throw this out there right away is I refer to this handbook all the time uh, for commissions that are very, that are new, that I haven't done before, that I'm not sure how to price. For example, I just started um, a commission on a board game, um, or I'm in the process of this negotiation of doing a board game, and I have never done a board game before, and thus, you know, uh, <laughs> like, you pulled out that handbook, found out in there what the standard is for kind of how to price board games, boom, that's, that's it, baby. <laughs> so get this book. It saved my life. It, I don't know a single professional illustrator who does not have this handbook. Um, so it is, it is standard. Um, okay. Enough about that book. Uh, know your audience, uh, and you'll figure out pricing. I swear. Uh, so what I mean by this is if, for example, you're at a market, maybe you don't know this yet because maybe you haven't done markets yet and everything is canceled right now, but if you have sold at markets before, think about who is buying your work, your original work that's there. That's your audience. So I know that my audience are young professionals and students. Um, and so my pricing is a little cheaper because of that, because I, I know that's what they can afford. I can push it out um, and get, get a really good demand for it. Um, but I also know my audience for when it comes to book publishing and things like that. And so my prices change depending on who's coming up to me. Um, I do have, <laughs> that being said, uh, I do have a consistent list of prices and I recommend you have a consistent list as well. And the reason for that is if you have a client who comes to you, again, we're going to use this example of they want a painting of their dog and you charge them $300 for it and then their friend loves it and wants one for themselves, hears from their friend, it was only $300. They come to you, they want the same exact kind of thing, you know, nothing's changed, just the dog, and you charge them $500, oof. <laughs> like, you might not know that that person knew the other person that you did the same dog for, and now you are known for being unreliable with your pricing. Um, so I have a little check sheet kind of at my desk at all times. I also refer to my own website often to kind of check how I, how to maintain kind of what my pricing standards look like for individuals. Um, and I try to stay consistent with that. Again, one exception is businesses. Always ask businesses, business clients, what their budget is. Trust me, they have one. Um, it will, and if you ask that and they come back with a number, it will most likely be more than what you were going to price it yourself. Um, that's not always the case. I have been surprised, um, but I, that, is, that is my one kind of big tip is get businesses, uh, businesses budgets first. Okay. All right. Gaining clients. Uh, so uh, I love, I love <laughs> doing commissions so much, but one of the things that always really scared me starting out was how do I, uh, how do I get commissions? How do I get clients? How do I get clients that stick around as clients um, for repeat projects? Um, so this whole section is going to be about as, as it suggests, gaining these clients and good avenues to start. So, um, so you have your pricing figured out, you figured out like how you want to, like how much time you want to put uh, into your week dedicated just for commissions. 
uh, here are the avenues that I recommend. These are the ones that have worked for me. Um, I am certain I am missing probably a hundred <laughs> different um, different options. Um, but again, these are these are the ones from my own experience that I can talk about that have worked tried and true. So that is markets, mailing lists, galleries slash cafes, uh, social media, messaging businesses, and then word of mouth. So we're gonna hop right in. Uh, so we're gonna start with markets. And obviously I don't need to tell you guys, especially a lot, there are a few people in this, uh, in this group that I immediately recognized from markets. This is not applicable in 2020 anymore, um, but this will be post COVID. Um, so at a market, you're already showcasing the art that you like to make. If someone buys that work, chances are they will want something custom. You know, they might have your painting hanging on a wall <laughs> in their house and they're staring at it for six months and they finally decide, you know what, I won't, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get some custom art from this person. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I would do is, and what I have done is put a notebook on your table or sheet of paper, whatever, uh, that is both a mailing list and a commission follow-up. So what I do is I have a notebook and I have all the like mailing list info, you know, name, email, um, and then I have a column that's just for, would you like me to send you commission information? If they check yes, they want to, great. Email them right after the market and see if they're interested, or excuse me, email the people that are interested after the market with a general like, hey, I heard you're interested. This is like kind of my, I do flat rate, you know, or I do hourly, what have you. Um, this is what I like to do, blah, blah, blah. Contact me if you want, thanks, you know, <laughs> bye. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, don't follow up again, just send the one email. The reason for that is you don't wanna bombard them because they probably got it. Um, also, by putting it in with the mailing list, you already then have them on the mailing list and uh, they're gonna be getting information from you every month. And the reason I bring that up at the end of this is we're gonna talk about mailing lists. <laughs> Another way to gain clients is to have that mailing list and have them on there. This is a really good way to remind them that you exist still. Um, so if they don't respond right away to a commission follow-up, let's say, the reason you don't want to keep bombarding them with emails of like, hey, did you think about that commission? Do you still want that commission? You already have them on the mailing list. So put in the mailing list your commission info. Just throw it throw it at the bottom, throw it in the middle, whatever. Send out an email, you know, I, my mailing lists also have like upcoming events and discounts and stuff like that. Um, include the commission stuff and then they'll be reminded in that moment, like, oh yeah, that's right. They sent me that commission information. I'll go check that out. Um, so I would send out a monthly newsletter maybe, throw it in there, easy peasy. Um, I usually get one or two commissions every month right after I send out uh, my monthly mailing list or my monthly newsletter. So it, it has worked for me. Uh, I also, if, if you keep it personal and you keep it, uh, or I should say personable in your mailing list, then you're showing the client your, your personality. And that might also help them decide like, oh, she seems really cool. <laughs> like, I really should reach out to her. She doesn't seem scary at all. Like, this, this should be an easy process. Um, so, heck yeah, mailing lists. Heck yeah, newsletters. Uh, another way to gain clients is to show your work in public. And that could be galleries, that could be cafes. It really depends on who you want your audience to be, or if you already know who your audience is. 
they usually fall between these two sort of categories. Um, so that could look like, so, okay, galleries are really great for your resume and you'll get your wealthiest, your wealthiest clients from, from there, typically. But cafes <laughs> have a wider audience and you're going to be getting a lot more local impact of people who are regulars, who get to look at your art every day. Um, and chances are they're going to want some of that. Uh, but again, it depends on your audience. So for example, <laughs> I still have people who recognize my work from when I had it hanging in Black Locust Cafe back in February 2019, but also my audience is made up of students and young professionals, like I said earlier, and they love cafes. So it works out for my personal business structure where galleries might work better for yours. But I would not, as, as a former fine artist, as somebody who went through and got her BFA, we were always told that like cafes are like the lesser gallery, <laughs> like don't get your work in there, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that is not true. Burn that idea. You will be surprised by how successful you can be by showing your stuff in just a simple gallery or in a simple cafe rather. So uh, social media. <laughs> so, uh, what I always tell people is post the work that you, you love to make, not what other people might like, um, and try to be consistent. So don't just make and post stuff that you think people will like, but you don't actually like doing yourself. Um, the reason for this is people will see that you're posting a lot about this thing, and then they might want some of that same thing. And then you're just doing commissions on stuff you don't like to do. Whereas if you are just kind of being yourself, putting out work that you really like, and you really like to make, those people are gonna see that and they're gonna go, wow, I didn't realize that I like that too. I want, I want custom work of this. And then all of a sudden you're doing a bunch of commissions and getting paid to do stuff you like to do. <laughs> it's the ideal dream job. Uh, so when I first started out, I am also guilty of doing a lot of like roses and portraits of animals <laughs> and stuff. And then it was only when I got like really weird and like did my type of art that I started getting really cool clients and like, it, it just all came together in a really nice way. And it feels so good to do work that I really like to do instead of doing work that is like, uh, another dog. <laughs> like, yeah, so I would also throw in this hot tip. If there is a particular theme or type of commission that I want to do or you want to do, um, I like to throw it in the description of that social media post like I did above. So, uh, you know, just throw at the bottom like, hey, I really like drawing, you know, witches. Does anybody want witches? <laughs> That's a weird example, but uh, in this case, I had just done a mural. So I was like, if anybody else wants a mural, come hit me up basically. And whenever I do a social media post like this, I usually receive a few new commissions literally within 24 hours of that post. So it works. Trust me. <laughs> uh, Another thing you can do if you are particularly um, wanting business clients or local business clients, uh, message those businesses. Um, and again, this is more, I should stress, this is mostly effective for local businesses. Um, so what I know to be true is that businesses often need artists, uh, but they're business people. <laughs> they do not know how to find them. and what they end up doing is Googling artist, question mark, and they get overcharged by a non-local artist to do a thing that, you know, you're living right down the street. You could have done that for a little bit cheaper, maybe, or the same price, and it still would have been local. So if you like a business and you think that your portfolio matches their aesthetic, reach out via email, uh, show up at the business, introduce yourself, show some examples of your work and 
do a nice little courtesy like hey if you're ever looking for an artist you know like to do a mural inside your shop or to do t-shirts or whatever let me know like think of me don't call up joe schmo in california to paint a skateboard on your like shit like get the local artist in uh if you have a t-shirt design that you think would look rad and you are willing to still draw it i i will say uh i really hate again doing work for free <laughs> um so i'm not suggesting you do work for free but if you are like you know what i bet that this business would love this um make it if you again if you want and you have the time watermark it <laughs> so that the business doesn't steal it um and offer to the business for a price so for example i designed this t-shirt uh, or this uh this illustration that i posted here uh for freedom skate shop here in madison i sent it to the owner he loved it and he bought it on the spot and we will hopefully see that next spring um but i again hot tip make the design something not specific to that business so for example if freedom didn't like this design that i had made for in with them in mind uh I could easily remove the freedom banner from the background and try selling it to a different skateboard company, you know? So you, uh, yeah, like don't get super crazy. Like don't send a bunch of <laughs> like illustrations to people or whatever, but like, you know, do it thoughtfully, do it in a way that you might be receptive to if you were a business owner looking for something. Um, so yeah, last but not least for gaining clients, word of mouth. It is the tried and true version of getting clients. Um, so just talk to people. I'm going to like skip through this slide. I just saw that there's like only 10 minutes left uh, and we have a lot to cover still. So um, word of mouth, gain that reputation, gain a good reputation. Clients talk to their friends. You will gain clients over time purely from word of mouth. I personally if I didn't want to, would not have to uh, do any commissioning mark commission marketing moving forward because I organically receive commission um, emails every month without me doing any particular post or any particular thing. Uh, purely from, hey, you did a design for my friend. I really want something similar. Done. Uh, all right. Contracts, security deposits, and payment plans. Uh, so what we're gonna cover here is totally um, kind of just your, uh, the bare bone sort of like review of these. We're not gonna get super into this. It's, I won't be talking. Um, I heard that there was a question kind of earlier that uh, I won't be talking about royalties for example, you know, there will, there will be some things that I will not cover. Uh, this is more like, where do I even start? This is where you start. Okay. So, uh, contracts, <laughs> we'll start off with that. Uh, professionals do a couple of different things. There are informal contracts and there are formal contracts. I use both depending on the client and the situation. Um, I tend to use informal contracts with individuals and I tend to use formal contracts for businesses. Um, informal contracts are pretty general. You don't need to have anything like any signature, like formal signatures. You don't even need to have an invoice necessarily. I usually, like I have everything in writing via like email or text sometimes or Facebook Messenger. Like these are for the clients that are like, hey, I want a D and D character tattooed on me. Can you do that? <laughs> Can you design that? Heck yeah! Informal contract. Um, this informal contracts work because of security deposits, and we will get into that very shortly. Uh, formal contracts are kind of what you might imagine, what you have probably run into when you have done uh, done any services for yourself. They are very specific. They require signatures um it's it's a it's a far more legally binding contract than something very informal so contracts for individuals um 
again, like a person who wants a painting of their dog. Uh, I almost exclusively do an informal contract with, except if the client personally requests a formal one, uh, which I've never run into, but I would of course be, would do that. Um, and commissions that are over $1,000 simply because they are very expensive and I want that money. Uh, so I prefer informal contracts because being negotiable with my prices is a part of my business strategy uh, for individual clients. Not always necessary though. So what to include in, a, uh, in an informal contract is your payment information, like if you do flat rate versus hourly, uh, you know, general security deposit info, general payment info, your refund information. So is there a refund timeline? Does it change depending on if you started the piece versus after you finish it? Uh, that sort of thing. There will be communication information that kind of sets boundaries and expectations like, uh, yes, I'll show you the full process of my thing or no, I won't <laughs> or, you know, please don't contact me on business, like on weekends, that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, commission specifics, this can be generalized. Like for example, in my informal contract, it states like, I only do black and white and digital, <laughs> full stop. Um, and then of course include kind of what deadline schedules might look like. You know, I tend to do six to 14 business days or whatever. Um, so those are just like general things you can include in there that are uh, derived from a formal contract. For businesses, uh, formal contracts are almost always uh, necessary. Of course, I have, when you kind of start working with a business, sometimes they, they're just like, let's just do something informal too. If you trust that, do it. Um, what I will say is that businesses who regularly hire on contractors 99% of the time will have their own formal contracts. Read them carefully. If anything looks fishy, hire a lawyer. <laughs> and I can't really give you examples of what fishy things look like. Uh, I have heard some fishy sort of con like contractual things with murals and businesses um, where they can like profit off of prints of the image after the fact or something like that. Uh, but um, what I will say is that formal contracts are very specific and uh, they tend to include specific agree agreed upon commission prices, payment plan deadlines. Um, so like I'll pay you $700 after the sketches and $700 after the final. Uh, it'll have a security deposit deadline, although I rarely do security deposits with a formal contract because the contract itself is legally binding. Um, there'll be commission specifics that are usually added as an extra schedule. So that'll kind of do the outline of specific projects and stuff. Um, Non-compete and confidentiality set by the business. Basically, do not talk about this project until it is finished and until we post about it, for example. Like if you're doing a book project. Um, uh, there will be stuff about breaking contract, there will be stuff about the specific project deadline, and then there will be signatures for all relevant parties. Uh, for sure you, the artist, but it might also be the business's lawyer or another representative. <sighs> so much information. Okay. <laughs> security deposits. Uh, security deposits are a measure of security for the recipient, aka you always require a security deposit <laughs> always never start a project without getting paid a portion up front again unless there is a specific formal contract with a specific business um, this is standard practice for any type of contractor because remember you are a professional providing a service <laughs> Bakers do it, house painters do it, landlords do it. Everybody who provides a service for money requires a security deposit. I have never had a client refuse to pay a security deposit because that is how standard it is. If you run into a client who refuses, perhaps don't take them on as a client. Uh, that might be a red flag that they are not intending on paying you at all for your work. Uh, 
the reason that you should require a security deposit is because sketches and preliminary work is work. Uh, if it takes up any of your time, you need to be compensated for it. So like, what if you finished a complex sketch and the client ghosts you, just stops responding? Uh, that was a waste of your time and time equals money. Um, so the way that you can kind of map out a security deposit is estimate how long a sketch or the preliminary stage is. So let's say it takes an hour and a half for you to get a sketch together. Um, calculate that with your hourly rate. And yes, that also applies to flat rates. So say you're $50 an hour, you multiply those together and $75 is the minimum that you should charge for a security deposit. Uh, that security deposit will then be included as part of the total. So if the commission is $200, 125 would be due after the security deposit has been paid. Um, security deposits are a form of trust between you and the client. It shows them that you are a professional and are serious about their commission. And then it shows you that the client respects your time as a professional because you're a professional doing a service. <sighs> Payment plans. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm rushing through this just so rapidly. Um, <laughs> we're going to get we're going to get through this. OK, payment plans give the client an option to pay for their commissions and portions. Um, if you would like me to explain anything more about payment plans, I feel like they're kind of self-explanatory. It basically allows a client to pay um, in stages. And I really like providing it because it allows um, It'll, it allows for some flexibility. It, if the client decides they no longer want to move forward, uh, there's not a huge refund that you have to provide. Um, it can be very nice, which this whole, the slides will be available on Dabble's website. So uh, you can review this on there if you would like. I hope you guys are okay with me just skipping past payment plans. Again, if you have any questions about it later, I would be happy to answer. Um, okay, it's eight o'clock, but we got this last section. <laughs> uh, are we all okay with me continuing? Um, let me just yeah, I think we can do a few more minutes and then we'll just offer up um, some contact info if you're okay with that for cool. questions later. Totally okay. Uh, so client relationships. Um, this is all gonna be some hot tips. <laughs> uh, because maintaining client relationships is so, 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 so important. Um, so uh, why is this such a huge deal? Why is it important to have good client relationships? Because if you are good to your clients, they will become repeat clients. Um, maybe not immediately, but it, it's, usual, it's pretty typical that if you have a great relationship with your client, they'll want to work with you again. Um, in my own experience, <clears throat> because I, I love being really good to my clients, I love like forming a relationship with them that's both appropriate and professional. Um, I am now the uh, lead illustrator for a lot of local businesses and I love it, I love it. So and I can thank that all for having a good relationship with my clients. So number one, uh, be communicative at all times. Uh, excuse me, had to take a drink of water. Okay. Uh, don't ever let a client think that they're being taken advantage of. Um, communicate everything. Don't, like, I, it's up to you, of course, how communicative you want to be, but try to just be honest and forward and uh, just let clients know what's going on. We're all human. Be kind and patient. Uh, clients are rarely artists. Uh, so always reassure them that there are no dumb questions by reassuring clients that like they can ask whatever they want um, and that it'll be taken seriously. Then you can, like I said earlier, you can get through those commissions a lot smoother than you might if they're like, uh, I, this is kind of a dumb question, so I'm not going to ask in the sketch phase. And then you get to the ink, like you ink it and they're like, oh, okay, earlier I didn't like this thing and then it didn't change. <laughs> so now I want this change. That's so much more work for you. 
uh, you might have to charge the client more. Like, just if you are really patient and kind right up front and let them know that everything is like dandy <laughs> or whatever, like they will feel more comfortable asking questions and hopefully making the whole process a lot easier for both of you. Keep deadlines. <laughs> Do not gain a reputation for being late. Uh, stay on time or early. If you can't, that may be a sign that you are overloading yourself with commissions and you should maybe dial it back a little bit. I am personally in that boat right now <laughs> where I did not expect a project to take as long as it has and so I feel a little overloaded um, and have had to communicate with a few clients to let them know that uh, their deadline might have to be pushed back. Um, that being said, if there is a good reason for being behind or missing a deadline, and yes, poor mental health, like being depressed, <laughs> is always included in this, uh, never destroy yourself to finish a project. Commissions are not life and death. Um, just try to let them know ahead of time. See if they're okay with, a, with an adjustment to their deadline. 99% of the time, they'll be completely fine with it, um, as long as you communicate that with them. And that goes for formal contracts as well. You can, you absolutely just communicate. Um, I have had one formal contract. Uh, my computer died on me very unexpectedly a few days before commission, and they were very understanding about pushing a deadline back a week. So always do it if you, like, always communicate it. <laughs> Don't just be late because something happened. And lastly, thank them. <laughs> it is the easiest thing to do, but like literally, even if they're a nightmare client, chances are they may have friends in higher places uh, who will be your client in the future. Don't burn bridges unnecessarily. But also like, of course that isn't meant to say like, don't stand up for yourself with a nightmare client, but try to thank anybody who you are finishing a project with for thinking of you and that sort of thing. It goes a long way. So another thing that you could do is like add a few extra touches, send a client a holiday card or something, check in with them during COVID if you're on a project. Just, you know, ask yourself the right, the golden, the golden rule or whatever, like how would you want to be treated if you were a client? That's probably how you should treat your own clients. Okay, in conclusion, we did it guys. Okay. So in conclusion, we have the coolest career in the world. So have fun with it. Don't super overthink the commission thing. Uh, again, put out the work that you want to make. People will want something similar and then you're gonna get commissions of stuff you actually like. Uh, people who want custom art in any form tend to be pretty rad. <laughs> uh, you may be surprised when former clients become supportive new friends. Um, be professional. Remember that you're human. And lastly, you are a professional providing a service. <laughs> so it is all fair to be asking for money for art for commissions. Huh. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel like I should do like a mic drop, like this has been TL. <laughs> awesome. A bunch of little just information that where you can find me please consider if you enjoyed this workshop, I do a lot of blogs and vlogs about uh, art professional things and creative things on my Patreon, which you can go to www.patreon.com slash TL underscore Luke. Ah, okay. I <laughs> Stop, share. Awesome. Thanks so much, TL. That was super awesome, super informative. Uh, and everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Devil 2020 Workshop Wednesdays. This is underwritten by Dane Arts, and we so appreciate all the work and support that Mark and his team provides us. Uh, please, please sign up for the Dane Arts newsletter at danearts.com if you want to learn more about all the great work that they do and opportunities for artists. Uh, this and all workshops are recorded and are released on our website, which is dabblemarket.com, D-A-B-L market.com. If you like this workshop or have any comments, please, please fill out the survey linked in the chat and post it on the website. Again, thank you so much, TL and Dane Arts. I uh, hope everyone has a good night. And TL, you said it, you were okay with people reaching out if they have questions? Absolutely. Yeah, please awesome. do. Um, would you like me to put 
should we leave this open for a minute or would you like excuse my here's my email awesome. uh, oops, that was just to you sarah sorry no problem yeah, and the tl's email is dropped in the chat so if you want to jot that down for any questions again thank you so much uh our next workshop is in two weeks so go ahead and pay attention to our facebook instagram and website for that uh, have a good night bye <laughs>